Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Beneath the Surface. Today we'll be discussing current events in Bahrain and joining us on the show is Sharif Nashashibi, an award-winning journalist and analyst on Arab affairs. Thank you very much for joining us Thank again. You. When we're to look at Bahrain, uh, going back in history, um, it's tried to be a, democ- a democratic equal country for many years, like the nation itself. Why do you think that, you know, they, whenever they seek for democracy, it doesn't, they, there can never be a chance of it? Well, because Bahrain is, is an absolute monarchy. And um, if you're going to implement democracy, that means that power is no longer with the monarchy, it's with the people. So, uh, and this is not just particular to Bahrain, but any absolute monarchy is going to view democracy as a threat. Or even any, any absolute dictatorship, it doesn't have to be a, a, a monarchy necessarily. But they will view democracy as a threat to their power because it means the power is with the people and no longer with, with uh, the head of state. But then democracy isn't really like that. As long as, you know, they're treating, you know, one citizen just like the other, there shouldn't be that big of a problem. They're still, like the people, you know, in power, they're still going to have their power. I don't see how that's going to affect them. Well, because in, 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 in situations where you have uh, a, a, spe- some, a, a leadership from a specific community in power um, that have privileges over other communities, they have a support base that supports them because they are given privileges. And equality means the removal of those privileges. It means everyone is equal. So if you do that, you are undercutting your support base and that threatens your position. And if someone enjoys their privileges, more often than not, they're not going to willingly or happily give them away. They have to be pressured to do that. But then when looking at Bahrain, there were many, because um, the Shias are mainly oppressed there, there were many Sunnis that you know, went out to the streets as well and were calling out for equality for the Shias as well. And the thing is, when looking at Bahrain, it's not as if you know, there was that little difference that would be like, okay, just live with it. No, there was a huge difference that many Bahraini people themselves didn't have citizenship whereas someone who's come from like Asia and stuff, they have citizenship and they have all their rights. You know, like this is where I'm speaking about equality. Well, I think the, <coughs> the issue of Bahrain, I mean, from the beginning has been portrayed in, in almost purely sectarian terms. Mm-hmm. Um, and partly this reflects a reality on the ground, but I think partly that served to overcomplicate the issue because it's, it's, <coughs> it's been seen, I mean, for instance, it's been seen as if this is not a movement for equality, it is a specifically Shia movement for, for, um, for dominance of Bahrain. And then beyond that, it's viewed as an extension of Iranian dominance of the region. So it's, it's been wrapped up in all these issues to make it seem extremely sinister and a threat to the viability of the whole country and to the status quo in the region, which is really not fair. I mean, ultimately, it is a, a movement based on, on equality of citizenship. Unfortunately, sectarian, sectarianism has, has been injected into the situation, but is also a, a reality that they, that they face on the ground. But then with Bahrain, um, the main thing that the majority of us, whatever sect we're from, liked was the fact that the, both Shia and Sunni actually came together, they united together, and this is where the whole sushi thing came of, you know, like the Sunni and Shias would eat together, which equals to sushi. But then they still, as you said, went on the whole situation as it being sectarianism, when it actually well, isn't. But if you look at, if you look, at, actually not just in the region, but let's take the region. Any, any direct challenge to uh, leadership in, in the region, the natural reaction is to try and divide the challenge, the challenges, into different parties so that you sow discord, potential infighting, and that weakens the challenge. And that's not just re- unique to the Middle East, but a- you know, any, th- this is an art of war, that you divide your opposition so you can more easily conquer and rule them. So that, that, that is, is, has ha- been happening in Bahrain and has been happening throughout the region, that when there's a challenge, immediately the, the easiest thing to do is to portray it as a sectarian issue, that, that this, this one sect wants their rights against the other sect and vice versa, and then it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, and then you actually have very real uh, uh, sectarianism and, and communities distrusting and killing each other. But how can it actually be against this one? Because well, it's it, it, it's not the necessarily the case. At, at, you know, at the beginning, it's viewed as you know. Well, if we give this community rights, then it's going to threaten our rights as our community. And then when that happens, then when division gets worse, then suddenly it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy because then both sides view the issue as a battle between you know either one side wins or the other side wins. But initially, as I said, what starts out as a movement for equality is 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 
portrayed and undermined as an issue of dominance over the over another, which is a, a, a misunderstanding and misconception of the of the movement from the outside. But then during the Arab Spring, or as some people tend to call it Arab Sting, when um, Bahrain decided to you know go to the streets and protest against what's taking place, it wasn't really covered as much as the other countries were. Why do you think that was? Well, I think there are a few there are a few issues. One is you know that at the time there was so much upheaval in the Arab world. It was difficult. The media is is it's a very one topic issue in the sense that you know they are able you know considering declining budgets for foreign news they are able to cover one uh, you know international crisis predominantly and then they move on to another one. They are unable really to focus on 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 different flashpoints in equality at the same time. So you had it at the time the entire region was 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 boiling. Um, so it had to to share really this media attention with everything that was going on in the region and the rest of the world. So that was one one thing. Another thing is the media environment in Bahrain is not conducive to easy access to proper coverage. I mean, uh, journalists there have very tight restrictions. They face quite severe punishments if they're if they're not if they don't do the job that the monarchy thinks they should be doing. So there are restrictions. Um, and then there is also the issue of, uh, for example, um, you know, there are certain, you know, Bahrain is allied to certain countries like Britain and the US. So there would be a reticence among certain sections of the media to focus too much on the issue because they don't want to ruin that relationship. So, you know, there are, there are different issues at stake. I don't think there was one overall overarching sinister reason why that wasn't the case. But there were, for all these different reasons, Bahrain didn't get the necessary attention. <coughs> also, for example, when we're looking at the, the fact that Bahrain is allies with certain countries, you have to look also that the, the, the Gulf Cooperation Council entered Bahrain to put down the revolution uh, for, the, for the Bahraini monarchy. Now, when you look at, at these countries, they also have very lucrative and long-standing ties, particularly with certain Western countries, which would add to the reticence to highlight this because then it would it might cause certain friction between between governments so um, you know for these different reasons Bahrain didn't get sufficient media attention but then when like they were trying to use the whole secretarian tone <coughs> why did they keep bringing Iran into this because I don't like when the situation was taking place and like until today to be honest there's so many events events taking place in Bahrain but they always use the Iranian card saying like the Shia you know, the Iran's helping the Shia, etc. Why do you think they use because, that? Because, <coughs> so in, I mean, in the region at the moment, there is this portrayal of, of that um, sectarianism is driven primarily by two countries, Iran on the Shia side and Saudi Arabia on the Sunni side. So any issue in the Middle East now, immediately one side will say, ah, oh, Iranian involvement. The other side will say, ah, oh, Saudi involvement. And then once that happens, you inject a regional dimension into it. It becomes a much... A, a, at least in perception, if not reality, a much more dangerous issue uh, that requires much more urgency. So this is this you will see a knee-jerk reaction. It's not it's not always based on any any evidence whatsoever. But to add this level of threat of fear of urgency, they'll say, ah, oh, this is a it's a foreign scheme, and these people are only agitating because because that country or th this country is telling them to do so. Uh, unfortunately, that's that that's a, even not just with with uh, with Iran and Saudi. You know, if there's, there is unrest somewhere, they'll say, oh, the, the Americans are behind it, or the Israelis, or the Saudis, or Iran. There's always, f there's always a, a foreign involvement to, to and that, sometimes that's the case, but also it is used as a tool to undermine the domestic movement, to say that that's only taking place because uh, of foreign involvement. But then with Bahrain, we do know that Saudi Arabia you know, did get involved, and so many um, you know, trucks and stuff came into Bahrain to help stop the protests from taking place mm. but then did Iran actually help because there wasn't much No, I mean it's, you know, there there is very little evidence uh, other than 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 verbal statements there there is very little evidence that there was any uh, certainly no direct Iranian involvement in Bahrain but this was as i said it was used as a convenient excuse to heighten the level of threat uh, to increase aid for the monarchy in Bahrain to say that this was part of a larger Iranian project uh, to take over. Now there are other examples in the region where there is evidence that Iran has got involved but in this particular case this was much more a kind of uh, a hollow accusation than any any evidence-based uh, situation on the ground. Because most of the people actually did you know become upset because they were like 
that you know this is something that we want and we don't even if Iran wanted to get involved we don't want it to be involved because this is more of a you know national thing we don't want any foreign um you know look i i think there is unfortunately <coughs> in the middle east when now that now that the issue of sectarian has become such a, a, a major thing is that when you have uh, a minority community in one country they are quite often viewed as outsiders or supported by outsiders. So suddenly their, their belonging to that country is, is called into question. And this is a very dangerous thing. Um, when you don't agree with someone just because you know, they are Sunni or they're Shia, and suddenly you feel that they're less of a national than you are, um, that enables um, atrocities to take place. When you, when you view that person who has exactly the same nationality as you as a foreigner just because of their sex, that's very dangerous. And unfortunately, that, that is happening increasingly in the, in the Middle East. We do kind of like you, you saying that. We do see that, for example, in Syria and in Iraq. But then in Bahrain, that wasn't actually the situation because you had a lot of Sunnis going out speaking, you know, for the Shias. So it wasn't, it wasn't as if like the Shias are kind of like marginalizing the Sunnis. It was actually the opposite. And this yeah. is what... But because, because, uh, I mean, because Bahrain is majority Shia, then naturally most of the protesters were Shia. But it didn't mean that this was a Shia movement. It, it, this was a movement for equal rights. But, but because most of the, the uh, protesters, because of the demographics of the country, were Shia, this was, uh, you know, similarly, for example, as the, the revolution in Syria is portrayed as a Sunni uprising. It's not. It, because Sunni, Sunnis are a majority in the country, it has been portrayed as such. But, you know, these movements started out as movements for, for rights that should be enjoyed by all citizens. But various parties have been able to say, oh, that this is a project by this particular community to undermine another community. This has been happening, the, this has been a hallmark of the Arab Spring, where revolutions have been undermined as a project by one group to, uh, to threaten, existentially threaten another group. But in Bahrain, the protesting has been going for a very long time, but nothing's actually changed. Well, the, the, the problem is, is you have, uh, I mean, Bahrain is part of the Gulf Cooperation Council. All these uh, member states of the GCC uh, have, you know, they are fully behind the Bahraini monarchy. So the, 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 the protesters in Bahrain are not just up against their monarchy. They are up against the, the, the leaderships of the entire region who will not allow that to happen. And we saw that. I mean, the GCC went directly in Bahrain to put down the revolution. So the, really the odds are stacked against them. They have, they are, you know, they are up against an entire, re an entire regional order that, that, let's face it, is, is pretty safe. I mean, the Gulf, as opposed to the rest of the region, is much safer. It is backed up by, uh, by allies, particularly in the West, who, who really will not allow any, any threat there that will uh, seriously threaten uh, any of the monarchies there. So it's, it's, a, it's a, a very rigid system to try and challenge. And because, although you've had still you know, low-level disturbances continuing since 2011, because it hasn't been able to reach a level where there, you know, that it has seriously been able to threaten the monarchy, then the media hasn't been involved because it's like any conflict that drags on for a long time. If it's just low level, it doesn't get attention. And that's unfortunately been the case since, since 2011, is that you know, protests, protests have taken place, but they have not been able to reach that critical mass where people around the world would, would pay attention again. But then you do have a lot of people paying attention, especially like the Bahrainis, that came to London and you know started their own uh, protests and everything. You do have that, but as you said, it's not as it's not enough for the whole world to know about. But then the fact that the events are still taking place in Bahrain and the Bahraini people are still you know being uh, oppressed in, in in whatever they are to do. Like if it was like with the whole situation, um, I just remembered when the pilot, when the um, presenter was speaking about how everything is safe and it's all okay and then she decided to take off the microphone because you know a soldier was hitting a female i believe it was you know like when that situation happens the way that media twists it isn't that something that should at least be covered i mean it should but <clears throat> for various reasons as i said when you know you have limited budgets so you focus on the biggest issues around the world um, and unfortunately at the moment there are bigger flashpoints uh, and any conflict that drags on long enough, um, we've seen it in, in lots of other conflicts, it tends to stop being news. Um, and because of the, the regional order, the alliances uh, that these, these uh, monarchies have, 
again, this would discourage uh, coverage that would s cause tensions between these, these alliances. Um, for, and, and fundamentally, again, the, the problem is Bahrain and other revolutions in the, in the region, they have been portrayed as simply a sectarian power play between bigger parties. So unfortunately, for example, I know many people who, for example, will, if there is a revolution in, in the Middle East that is, uh, let's say, that threatens a uh, Shia uh, interest, then Shias will support that revolution, but be against another revolution where where it's you know. It's exactly the same cause. Exactly, you know. So for for example, I mean, I know people who will say things about you know that Bahrainis are entitled to their rights, and I absolutely agree. But then they'll look at Syria and be like, no, 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 no. And I'm like, well, sorry, hold on. Let's look at this as a matter of principle. If you are pro human rights, if you are pro freedoms and democracy, then this should apply regionally. It yeah, shouldn't matter. Double standards. Exactly. It shouldn't matter whether the protesters are predominantly Shia or Sunni or whether the leadership that's challenged is Shia or Sunni. You take them as people, as citizens of that country, and take it as a principle. Unfortunately, too many of the too many people that that I know and people in the region take a stand according to what sect they're from and what sect uh, the protesters are from and what sect the leadership is from, and they take their stance based on that, not on the principle that everyone in those in the in the region should be treated equally as citizens of a country rather than favored or disfavored because they're from one or other community. No, I agree that does tend to happen, but then the whole thing of Syria differs completely to Bahrain. No, at at the core of all these revolutions in the Arab world was people were fed up of being tr uh, ruled by dictators who had a complete say in how the country was run. There was widespread corruption. There was human rights abuses. There was subservience to foreign powers. These, if you look at grievances around the Arab world, they are common. These are common problems in the Arab world. They are. The, uh, and unfortunately, sectarianism, sectarianism has been used to divert the, f the, 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 the issue that, of course, in each country in the region, of course, there are, there are differences in different circumstances. But underlying the grievances, public grievances, were these commonalities, that people were fed up of authoritarianism, of stagnant economies, of mismanagement, corruption, torture, all these things. They, they, people just want their rights. Unfortunately, sectarianism was used as a smokescreen, and now it's become a self-fulfilling prophecy because people now do view themselves as from this sect against the other sect, and, it's, and now it's become much more complicated to, to solve. It has, but then when we to look at Egypt, for example, the fact that, you know, they were able to move uh, Mubarak and, you know, he was sentenced to however much it was and, you know, people felt, you know, freedom. Well, then the way that it's actually happened isn't actually free. So, no. like, can we take that as an example, for example? Not, of course, agreeing with um, dictatorship, but then how can we learn from that to improve the other countries like Syria, Bahrain, Iraq, etc.? <coughs> well, I mean, uh, in Egypt, uh, you see, what's happened in Egypt is not the fulfillment of the revolution. I mean, it's quite the opposite. The revolution has been. Been, has been completely rolled back. Mm -hmm. um, but again, this comes to my point of, of the, the, the leadership in Egypt has been able to do this because it has successfully divided opposition. You have an Islamist opposition to the leadership. You have a liberal opposition to the leadership. There is no coordination between them for various reasons. Uh, I mean, primarily because of the misrule of, of, of Morsi that these, these uh, two major camps don't, co don't coordinate, which means that the leadership can much, much more easily pick them off because they're not, they're not united. The reason why the revolution against Mubarak succeeded was that a spectrum of the Egyptian community came together for a common cause and, and brought him down. Since then, that hasn't been the case. The, you know, the, the initial opponents of Mubarak, you know, is now there, there's all this infighting with each other. And again, this is... This is the same in other countries where there has been unrest and revolutions, is that the leaderships to varying degrees have been able to manufacture or accentuate differences within the opposition movements to sow discord and infighting. And that, that is the golden opportunity for a, a particular leader to stay in power. But then one of the things that I'm not able to understand is, like with Morsi, for example, he was elected, he was wanted by everyone, not agreeing with what he had to say because you know, there are a few things that are a bit controversial, but that's just a different matter. But the fact that he was elected and then he was asked to step down, he was forced to step down. Well, how was that democracy and how was that actually well, bringing the revolution into practice? Okay, we, we, there, there is such a thing as someone being democratically elected, but not ruling democratically. And unfortunately, I believe Morsi fell into that trap 
and he's not the only leader. I think Maliki also, as he was, he was elected, but he didn't, he didn't uh, govern democratically. Mursi wanted to, he, well, he passed a decree that put him above the law. That's not democratic. I mean, that, that's what a dictator does. And that was the beginning of the end of his, of his, of his presidency. The opposition movements began from then. And then even, even though he rescinded that decree a few weeks later, the damage was done. Because in the eyes of people, this was a person who, although elected, just wanted to be another dictator. And, and from then on, the, the protests grew to the point where I, I believe he should have called elections. He refused to call elections again. I believe he should have. Because if he won those elections again, he could say, look, I still have a mandate to rule. And if he lost those elections, then he would be fulfilling the will of the people. I believe since that decree and then from then onwards, he became too rigid, insisting that he was legitimate, even though protests kept growing. And ultimately, that led to his demise. I think he should have called elections. I, you know, even if someone is democratically elected, when you know that certain policies you have made have caused so much disruption within a country then you should behave not in the interests of yourself or your party, but in the national interest and say, OK, let's call elections again and see what the people feel. But then when we to move back to Bahrain, how come the Bahraini news channels don't actually cover their own um, affairs, like their own national affairs? Well, they, they don't cover uh, negative affairs because they're state owned. I mean, the, you know, there, there is no independent media. You know, if, 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 they, if they cover anything that would make the monarchy look negative, then they, would, they won't be in existence. And, regionally even, I mean, there is, there is an understanding in the region I, among Gulf uh, news outlets that they don't, they, not, the, not that they don't criticize only their own uh, leaderships, but they don't criticize the other Gulf leaderships. This is, there is an understanding. And so, so in Bahrain, you're not going to have independent media that's allowed to, to either to talk to the opposition or to portray the, the monarchy negatively. And this was seen very vividly in the the closure of Al Arab uh, station, literally just after it launched its broadcasting, because it had the audacity to interview an opposition member, um, even though they also interviewed the information minister. But the fact that the opposition member was on TV was too far for the for the monarchy, and they were closed very abruptly. But then, isn't was Al Arab an independent news channel? Well, it 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 wanted to be, and I think I think it started with that intention. I mean, to it it, it wanted to be independent, and it wanted to be even-handed. And I think I think what it did with its launch tried to achieve both. It interviewed an opposition member, um, which want which I think showed that they wanted to be independent, and it also interviewed the information minister. So I think it wanted to show that it was even-handed, that it could break taboos while still being even-handed. So I think it had the right intentions, but it was, for me, incredibly naive because initially they said that they, because it's, it's owned by the Saudi prince, Prince Walid bin Talal, that they couldn't launch in Saudi because there's no independent stations in Saudi. But how they thought they, they could operate independently in Bahrain is baffling because they made the decision to launch in Bahrain after the revolution had already started in Bahrain where it was brutally put down, where it was obvious that the monarchy was completely intolerant to dissent. So how did they think that they could, they could set up in Bahrain, be independent and operate uh, the way they wanted to without the government shutting them down if they, if they breached any of these red lines? I mean, it, you know, for someone who's as business savvy as Prince Walid, I thought I, I just I couldn't understand the rationale behind the launching in Bahrain. Because I was just going to ask, how come the, the Saudi prince decided to actually put it in Bahrain? Well, exactly. It, it, it doesn't really the make the sense. decision was made after it was bluntly obvious that, that it couldn't really operate independently. Um, but on a, you know, on a wider issue, it's, it would be difficult to think where in the Arab world he could have launched to op and operate independently. Because wherever he set up base in the Arab world, you would not be able to criticize your host government um, or the governments of their allies. And, th and this, is, this is a regional problem. So. This highlights not just a, a, a problem in, in Bahrain, but a, a wider problem that independent journalism in the Arab world is still a pipe dream. It is extremely dangerous and extremely difficult. But then how are we actually going to be able to learn and, and not just learn, but have that freedom of speech where, you know, if you've done something wrong and I'm to criticize you, you just take it because, you know, what the act you did was wrong. So I'm just criticizing. Yeah. Well, you know, the, the, the ploy that's used uh, is basically that dissent is portrayed as subversive to national security. And this is a, a region-wide approach. Mm -hmm. And especially now where you have issues of jihadism and, uh, and groups such as ISIS, that immediately any form of dissent is lumped together as this existential threat to national security. 
And that's why they're able to shut down freedom of, freedom of expression, because it's viewed not just as a criticism of, for example, uh, a particular government, but uh, of the very national fabric. Because suddenly, you know, if you're, if you, if you are, uh, if you're a critic, then either you're a foreign puppet or you're a religious extremist or you're an anarchist. There's always a sinister reason behind your criticism when it can actually just be a very valid criticism that anyone in the West can make of their government, but somehow we are unable to make because our leaders are completely intolerant to any form of criticism. But then don't you think that one of the reasons to why ISIS was actually created is because they've been shut down so much that if they are to express themselves in one way or another, they'll just be like, you know, taken to prison or something. Well, one of the reasons why ISIS has been able to, to expand the way it has, and Al-Qaeda did too, is repression. I mean, if, if you repress people, if you, if you don't give them any avenues to express themselves, then they will, they will be radicalized. Th and this has happened around the world. This is, not, again, not an issue particular to, to the Arab world. So unfortunately, you know, you have these decades of authoritarian rule, people become radicalized, people feel, as well also, uh, another issue is, is when, when freedom, of, uh, freedom of expression is curtailed, often uh, religious institutions are used as the only uh, way of expressing that. And again, not just with Islam. If you look at, I mean, for instance, uh, Soviet rule in, in Eastern Europe. I mean, the, you know, uh, when Soviet rule ended, um, people identified a lot with, with, their, with their Catholicism because it had been suppressed for all this time. And, that, and, and during Soviet rule, the church was used as a form of expressing dissent where they couldn't outside. So this is another issue, is when, when this, this happens, people um, view that th their only outlet of, of venting is through their religious institution. And, then, and that's where they, they, uh, the, the, the entire issue takes on a religious hue and when you add that to radicalism, then suddenly you get people like ISIS and Al-Qaeda. And again, I think, although there is so much evidence to back this up, again, now the, the, the policies being used to tackle this in the region are repeating the same old mistakes. They are purely military ventures, as if, as if you, know, you can militarily, militarily defeat an ideology. You can't. You have to, to enact reforms. You have to... Uh, enfranchise people, you have to get them involved in politics, in the economy, in society. I mean, unless people are emancipated, then, then this issue is going to, to recur. After Al-Qaeda, there was ISIS. After ISIS, there'll be something else. So we're, they're repeating the same old mistakes, a purely military solution to a much wider problem. But then if we're not to look at it military, of course, going off a bit of the um, Bahrain, but with ISIS, if we're to not attack them military what what else can someone do i'm not saying that that there shouldn't be a military uh, a military approach mm -hmm. but the problem is it's a solely military approach and that's that's the problem it, it, there needs to be a multi-pronged effort where yes military uh, the military is involved but also you know you have to look at on the ground of how government policies in these different countries is contributing to the radicalization radicalization that gives fertile ground to these groups and you can't focus on one or the other. You need, you need a dual approach. But then one of the things that most people tend to say, and unfortunately it's mainly the Arabs, that Arabs can't actually live with democracy, which is something quite offensive. But then that yes. is what's actually mostly said, that you know, the Arab world only works with dictators. Do you, do you agree with that? I've never agreed with this. I think, I think it's deeply offensive to think that what, we are so backward that we, we can't speak for ourselves and we can't determine our own futures. This is so backward. But unfortunately... The way that, th that the Arab Spring has turned out, has been manipulated, you know, you call it what you want, is that people who hold that view feel vindicated. And that's very dangerous because I think it will be a very long time before we see anything similar to the Arab Spring, where people in the region um, feel confident enough to take to the streets to enact change. And that's a real problem because I think right now, the uh, authoritarian leaders in the region feel much more comfortable, they feel vindicated in their view, and that people, the people they rule are too scared to rock the boat because they don't want their countries to end up like Iraq or Syria or Libya or Yemen. They don't want them to end up like a failed state. So people are very reticent, they're afraid. Um, I understand that, but this, is, this has been the golden opportunity of these leaders to say, well, we told you, it's either us or, or the religious fanatics, and that's exactly what happened. So unfortunately, ironically, ISIS is cementing the regional order. It's not disrupting it. People mm. are talking about, oh, they're redrawing the map of the Middle East. No, actually, since the Arab Spring started, now, thanks to ISIS, these leaders are sitting much more comfortably because they, are, they have, they have uh, been vindicated in this idea that you either have us or you have ISIS. Which one do you want? 
And unfortunately, people are afraid, and that keeps these people... These but that has power. literally become the situation. It's either, like, for example, if we're to look at Syria and Iraq, it's either ISIS or what we currently have, which is, you know, nothing... Like, with Iraq, it's a bit of a different situation, but mainly in Syria, the majority of people don't want Bashar al-Assad. Well, ultimately, all these revolutions, to varying, varying extents according to different countries, you mm-hmm. had issues of, uh, of, of them being portrayed in sectarian terms. You had uh, brutal government crackdowns, which led to radicalization. Uh, there was foreign involvement. You had all these different issues coming together, which meant that a lot of these movements, which were you know, truly domestic, uh, you know, spontaneous movements, suddenly became wrapped up in regional sectarianism, in, in foreign dominance, you know, and then infighting. So it didn't have to be this way, but it did. Unfortunately, where you have... Uh, militarized governments and militarized radicals, unfortunately, the, the moderate majority gets, firstly gets drowned out mm-hmm. and then su- gets sucked up. It becomes polarized, polarized. So then they join one, one, one group or the other and then it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. But the mistake is to think that this, was, that, that this was always going to be this way and that it was like that from the beginning. That wasn't the case. Things conspired, different issues conspired to make it happen that way. But then when we look, to look back at the um, news channel, Al Arab, with them, couldn't they firstly start off with at least a year or two looking at different countries, for example, and not focusing, of course, on the opposition or the actual government itself, not feeding... Well, I think it wanted... Look, it made, uh, it made promises of independence and uh, impartiality and even-handedness, and I think it wanted to make a splash. And, to, you know, there's no bigger splash than breaking a taboo, right? So, so uh, interviewing someone from the opposition was a taboo in Bahrain. And I think it would have, this was aimed at their audiences to, to say, look, we, we're putting our money where our mouth is, we mean what we say, and we are, you know, uh, we are operating independently. But how they thought they could do that was, you know, in a, in a country like Bahrain was uh, fanciful. I mean, the, the, that's the thing, like, if they stayed for at least a year where they're just covering other situations, like, for example, to speak about Iraq, you know, against, the, you know, get an opposition and get someone pro-Iraq, pro the government, that can kind of start the whole taboo, situ- like breaking that taboo situation, but well, not start s- straight away with they, Bahrain. If they waited to do that, I mean, look, the, the region is awash with, with, stations that are mouthpieces for one side or the other, okay? Um, if it started out that way, I mean, it, it, if it started out being really mild and not touching anything controversial, it wouldn't have had any audiences. It would the Audiences would have immediately assumed that, ah, oh, because it's, it's in Bahrain, it knows what not to say, and it's just another, another mouth, mouthpiece. So if it wanted to succeed, it had to make a splash, and that's what it did, and then and the government shut it down. But, you know, people in the region are sick of, you know, when I watch channels from that region, you know straight away. You know, you know what their angle is, what 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 uh, what interest they represent, because there are certain topics, certain stations never touch. Mm-hmm. People don't want. There are enough of those stations. People wanted something different. Unfortunately, you know, there, the environment isn't ripe for something like that. In the region. But then with Bahrain, it's mainly for the actual monarchy. It's not really for the opposition at all. You've just got one channel here in in the UK where it's um, you know where it's focusing on the opposition in Bahrain, which they've tried to shut many times. So with that, like, how are we, as, you know, m- the Middle East, how are we going to actually be able to learn from others, for other countries' mistakes and hopefully not have the whole, you know, situations that are taking place in Yemen, Libya, Iraq, Egypt? This is Syria. intrinsically linked to, um, to the respect for human rights and to, to democracy. Because, you know, of, of, well, of course there are problems in, in Western media, let's say, you know, journalists don't fa- in the West don't face the same fears and problems that they do in the region. I mean, journalists in, 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 in the West can criticize, go- you know, leaders and governments. They have the right to do that, to, to investigate them and, th- and things like that. That will land you in jail. That could land you with a death sentence in, 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 the, in the Arab And it has many times. Of course, yes. And, and, and that's the problem is, is we cannot hope for an independent media and for safe journalism while there are, uh, uh, where, the, where there is authoritarianism, authoritarianism in the region, that it's intrinsically linked. If 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 um, if people have their rights and have freedom of expression and have uh, dem- democracy, then that's when independent journalism can flourish. But when you're not allowed to say a word against the ruler, no matter how valid that criticism is, you will never have independent journalism. And even if if Al Arab launched in Bahrain and didn't didn't touch the issue of Bahrain. It wouldn't be able to say anything remotely controversial about an issue in the Gulf region in general. 
and even beyond that, I mean, for, for example, Gulf, the, the Gulf monarchies are very much behind Sisi in Egypt. Mm -hmm. Al-Arab wouldn't have been able to say anything critical of, of Sisi. They would have been shut down for that too. Um, would have been the same if they criticized the monarchy in Jordan. So it's not just about Bahrain. It's not even just about the Gulf. They wouldn't have been able to touch a whole host of topics regionally that would have affected uh, relations uh, with those other countries. So it would have been very obvious from the beginning, given all these different issues they wouldn't be able to touch, that it was either going to try and honestly be independent or be a mouthpiece. And I think it chose one and uh, the monarchy showed its hand straight away. But then couldn't they come to the UK, for example, or any other um, Western country and start off their Al Arab um, news channel? Uh, well, it could have. And, uh, you know, there are stations that have launched from outside the Arab world. I think, you know, the, the, the plus side of that, it, is, it has, allows you a certain independence that you simply wouldn't have in the Arab world. Mm -hmm. But then the other, the, but the problem is if, if you want to be on the ground to cover issues, it's very difficult from abroad. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and even if you send correspondence there, I mean, you know, look at the problems Al Jazeera, the Arabic station faced from its beginning. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was shut down in, in so many Arab countries for, for daring to say this and that about, about this topic or that topic or this leadership. Um, and its bureaus would be closed down, its journalists would be arrested. So, you know, uh, you have the problem from the outside of not having ne the necessary access on the inside. But then if you try and get that access, it, even being based in the West doesn't help. You, you, you still need accreditation. You, your journalists can be thrown in jail by these countries. So it's, it's fundamentally an issue of, of uh, a lack of access in the region and a lack of just being able to do a journalist job properly in any of these countries. But then how come the prince, who is, you know, part of this whole monarchy and, and, and I believe would agree with what, you know, is actually taking place, how come they would actually dare to, um, you know, speak about what's actually taking place in Bahrain? That's a bit well, weird. Look, Prince Walid, I mean, he's not, he doesn't, he doesn't speak officially on behalf of the Saudi uh, monarchy. And he's, he's always been quite an independent uh, prince and he's always been very business minded. So, um, He's, he's not a minister, a Saudi minister, for example, so I don't think he felt necessarily under the same constraints. But again, it, it was so incredibly naive of him to think that he would be able to get away with that uh, in, a, in a country such as, such as Bahrain. And the fact that there was no uh, official Saudi de, uh, de condemnation of, of the closure of the station means that, I mean, I think Prince Walid has no real backing from Saudi. Um, so he, <coughs> they have the dilemma now of, Either they resume broadcasting in Bahrain, but then people will immediately know that they've, that they've accepted the monarchy's restriction. Or, you know, you launch somewhere else. But there's so much money and time and effort has been, has been put into it. I mean, I don't know if this is to be even feasible anymore. So it's, uh, it's an impossible situation, I think, for them. But then when we're to look at the, like how the um, channel was actually closed down, do you think that that's just making it more... It's stressing on the idea that there can, there can never be freedom of expression or freedom of speech in Bahrain. Well, the, the manner in which it was closed down was, was laughable. I mean, really from both sides. I mean, firstly, the, 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 the authorities said that the, the station lacked the necessary permits. I mean, it made the decision to launch there you know, in, in 2011. They had lots of time to get the permits. And just a few days before the launch, the information minister praised the launch because it would uh, raise the Bahrain status, media status. So, you know, a few days prior, if they didn't have the permits, the information minister wouldn't be going and pra singing the station's praises. Mm -hmm. That was BS, let's face it. Of course, they would have had the necessary permits. And Al Arab, you know, to say, well, you know, we stopped broadcasting because of technical issues. Well, you had years to figure out these technical issues. If you launch a station, you check these issues before course, you launch, you not, not a few hours afterwards. So both sides, I mean, the station wanted to save face. It wasn't going to say, you know, we, we were shut down for the real reason. Um, but, but then, then the, the, if it did, wouldn't it have made more of a stand if it said that we're shut down for this and this reason? Would it not have made more people react in a way? Like the fact that a whole well, channel is being closed because they brought, you know, an opposition. Well, you know, I don't know. Maybe, maybe they hoped that they would be able to resume broadcasting from there, so they didn't want to, to, to say that. And, uh, you know, as well, you have to consider the lack of any Saudi condemnation. Of, uh, pr you know, probably the station felt very alone that they weren't going to get, get the necessary support f from Bahrain or from the region. So uh, that's difficult to say. You have to ask them why. But the, the rationale that, they, that there were technical issues, you would sort these out beforehand.
the, the authorities alluded to, to something along the lines of, you know, not, not the, the station not taking into account, you know, regional sensitivities, blah, blah, blah. I mean, that was really the real reason, was that basically they dared to interview an opposition member, and that, that was enough. The rest, no one believes that there, there was an issue of permits or technical issues. And that, that, just, that, that just, it was just laughable. And again, shows, you know, I don't know whether, you know, peop the authorities in the region take people for fools. That they, they think, do you really believe people will think that it was a, an issue of permits? Of course people know that it's, that they, 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 they crossed certain red lines. But um, I don't know whether they actually think people are fools or whether they really don't care. How I they don't look. think they care in how they're going to be looking oh, yeah. because yeah. they've just shut the channel anyway. Yeah. I mean, they do that and then they still say, oh, you know, uh, I mean, you know let's say if, some, if, a, if a media uh, outlet is shut down in the region, you know, the government that shuts it down, they'll do it and at the same time say, yeah, yeah we're an oasis of freedom of speech. And you, know. and you think, wow, I mean, you're either completely deluded or you must think everyone are fools to think that this is the case. So That is really what actually happens, especially in the Gulf. And Unfortunately, everywhere. It's not just the Gulf. The entire region is faced with this problem. That th that is true, and and hopefully, like with the freedom of expression that the majority of us Arabs are actually have in the West, we'll be able to actually bring that back to the Middle East. So thank you very much for joining us on the show. And thank unfortunately, you. we've run out of time. Thank you very much for watching Beneath the Surface. See you next time.